Good uh, morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to this uh, third session of our virtual uh, seminars, uh, seminars, uh, virtual technical seminars on long term energy scenarios for a clean energy transition in Latin America. My name is uh, uh, Pablo Carvajal, uh, I'm a head uh, of associate uh, uh, programs uh, in Irina Bonn in Germany, and I am happy uh, to uh, be here with you. Just uh, to start, uh, we have simultaneous interpreting, uh, so you need to go down to your screen, uh, your Zoom screen, you will be able to find uh, the interpretation button. Uh, just uh, click uh, on this uh, button and choice. Uh, and choose your language. You can use it through Android or iPhone. Simultaneous interpretation. Please use the interpretation button at the bottom of your Zoom window to choose your preferred language. Uh, and please make sure you're using the desktop client of Zoom or the Android iOS application. Muy bien. Um, well, uh, this is uh, a joint initiative uh, of uh, the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA, and the uh, and uh, the Economic Commission for Latin America, ECLAC or CEPAL in Spanish. Can we move on with the slides, uh, please? Brilliant. Okay, so. Uh, uh, basically, we want to have a platform in order to exchange experiences uh, of uh, energy uh, planners, government energy planners uh, in uh, Latin America, basically to talk about scenarios uh, and uh, different uh, uh, ways uh, of organizing the national plans uh, for clean energy. So each two weeks, uh, we will have uh, two countries from the region who will be uh, sharing their experiences in uh, planning. So we'll have uh, 10 countries uh, throughout the whole series. Probably we'll have 12 uh, who will be just, uh, we will have representatives from the ministries of the national energy uh, planning agencies. And this is in the framework uh, of the Technical uh, Forum uh, of uh, Energy uh, Planners uh, organized by CEPAL. And it is uh, one of the series of the, org of the events uh, that are organized by IRENA. Uh, so we had uh, presentations of uh, Brazil, Colombia, uh, Panama, and uh, Costa Rica. And uh, today we have the honor uh, to have presentations uh, from Ecuador, and Uruguay, two countries that are leaders in the transformation of their electric matrix. And Ecuador has carried out a phenomenal transformation in its energy system. And Uruguay also moved forward very clearly based on wind energy. And both countries are just working in just amplifying and improving their integrated scenarios for energy use. So we want to really take advantage of this situation in order to explore the different scenarios that, that they have and their tools of planification in uh, all uh, the regions. Uh, so we uh, welcome all of you and we hope uh, that you are just enjoying this uh, uh, series. And the next uh, slide, please. Uh, we're going to see our... Uh, can we... Okay, so we'll have uh, first uh, a... Uh, a brief uh, presentation, and then we'll have uh, the two uh, countries, uh, and then we'll have a conversation between uh, the moderator and the panelists, and then we'll have an uh, we'll have an interactive uh, survey of uh, and the questions. Uh, so we will be using the Zoom uh, platform, and as we receive uh, the questions, we'll be answering. Uh, and also, you can use uh, the chat uh, box, uh, basically. Please, uh, can you tell which institution you belong to? And we'll be very happy to answer your questions. And now we are going to move on to the welcome words uh, from uh, uh, CEPAL and uh, then get transform. So, Sepal, we have Ruban Contreras from the Energy Commission. Well, can you hear me? Good afternoon. Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. So, first and foremost, I would like to thank the representatives of Uruguay and Ecuador 
uh, without them, uh, would not have been able to do this. So thank you so much, uh, Ramiro and Alejandra, uh, for all your support. It's absolutely fundamental for us uh, to have this uh, dialogue, to listen to the voice of experience, to be able to generate an exchange of experiences between uh, the uh, countries uh, participating in the forum and uh, also between uh, the uh, between the organizations cepal the uh, planners uh, forum it is uh, fantastic to work with irena with get transform uh, and uh, to organize this type of uh, meetings i want to say uh, that uh, the planning issue is not only fundamental because uh, it is important to plan uh, for a sector which is uh, this uh, energy sector but also to have uh, responses uh, within this sector uh, to give responses uh, for the models of uh, transition that we have uh, and to face uh, maybe the different situations uh, that we can have or the questioning about uh, where are we going in terms of hydrocarbons, what are the needs of the different countries, what is the different situation. So depending on the internal demand also and uh, the acquired uh, commitments, uh, the synergies, the connections, uh, all these uh, issues are uh, very important uh, for the planning. We need uh, to have a roadmap in order to keep on moving forward and developing. Because if not, it will be very difficult for us to work this energy transformation. For example, when we have crises like this COVID situation, uh, so also we need to work about how we can have a much better foreign investment in the region and canalize it. So thank you very much, Pablo, for offering me the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Robin. We hope uh, uh, that uh, all those uh, who are uh, with us are safe and sound. Uh, and now I'm going uh, to give the floor uh, to Antonio Le Levy from Get Transform. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Pablo. Uh, welcome, uh, Ramiro, Alejandra. It's uh, a pleasure for us uh, uh, for you to be here. We are just so happy to collaborate with a series of uh, the seminars that are uh, extremely important for the region, not only because uh, of the issues uh, that are critical. And here we have the opportunity to really focus on two countries and learn uh, from their lessons uh, and share uh, their information and experience. But also we want to reinforce uh, the collaboration networks that are absolutely fundamental uh, to move uh, forward in the energy uh, transformations and get transformed. We work in three uh, sectors, which is the integral uh, planning, the centralized energy, and uh, the uh, energy transformation. So we're just uh, working. We are just uh, uh, working on a regional mapping, uh, which would be a, uh, a theme for a future forum. So uh, welcome, Ramiro. Welcome, Alejandra. Thank you so much for all the countries that, that participated before and will be participating in the future. And uh, those countries also that will participate in the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Pablo. I give you back the floor. Thank you so much, Antonio, for your words. And in Irina, we are extremely grateful for the opportunity that CEPAL is offering us uh, to working uh, together with the platforms uh, that you have and also want to uh, thank uh, the countries who are accompanying us. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your participation. Uh, so basically, uh, this uh, uh, organization between the countries, the agencies, etc., is going to be very benef uh, beneficial for all of us. And now we are going to uh, pass on to the first uh, presentation. So uh, we welcome Alejandra Reyes. She's the head of statistical planning and balance at the Ministry of Industry, Energy and Mines in Uruguay. Thank you so much, Alejandra, for being with us. And also Alejandra uh, is, uh, has been since 2013 the head of statistical planning and balance at the Minister of Industry. Uh, she uh, is working on the different inventories uh, of uh, 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 of uh, gas uh, emissions. Uh, she is just working on short-term and long-term uh, planning. And uh, we are extremely happy uh, to have her uh, today uh, to talk about uh, Uruguay. I'm giving you uh, the floor. If you can put your camera on, we'll be very grateful. Well, uh, good morning uh, to all of you. Oh, welcome. Welcome. 
Uh, first and foremost, uh, I just uh, work uh, in the National Directorate of uh, Energy in Uruguay. Uh, welcome to all of you. Good morning, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, greetings. Before I start with my presentation, I want to uh, thank and I want to congratulate uh, th all those who are just working in the forum, uh, Ruben, Irina, uh, uh, Sepal, uh, because it's an initiative uh, that get transformed. Thank you very much, uh, because uh, this is a very good uh, initiative that uh, brings us uh, a lot. Uh, so uh, we can have a guide of different uh, terms uh, to put together the terminology, the language that we use in the different uh, countries. Uh, uh, so uh, this is extremely important in order to understand each other, in order uh, to adopt the same uh, approach and the same uh, perspective, and also to uh, really reinforce uh, our uh, works. Uh, so so uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for this uh, initiative. It's uh, very good. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to participate in this uh, forum. And now, if you want, I can start with my uh, presentation. There are different uh, issues uh, that I want uh, to talk uh, about. Uh, so, well, I will be uh, talking about the developments uh, that we had the different uh, scenarios uh, that we worked on, uh, the planning, and uh, why we use them etc. So first and foremost, I believe that it's extremely important to start with the energy policy in Uruguay. Uruguay, since uh, for 2005, 2030, we had an energy revolution. So basically, the energy policy had a very strong impact on the energy matrix in Uruguay. This policy was approved in 2008. And in 2010, uh, this was a very important year. It was uh, approved uh, by the different uh, parties. So all who work uh, in energy will understand that horizon of four, uh, five years uh, don't generate uh, an important work in terms of sustainability, in terms of energy. Uh, so basically, I'm not talking about the lines of action. I'm talking about the objectives. Uh, so basically, we need uh, to have plans, long-term plans, in order to do this. So in the case of Uruguay, so uh, uh, we uh, uh, now we just understand that 2030 is uh, very close uh, and uh, we need uh, to take this into account. We need uh, to work uh, fundamentally on sustainability. We need uh, to have uh, uh, the main lines of our policy that are uh, sustainable and long-term uh, lines. And also uh, we had uh, also the national policy on uh, climate change also. Uh, so. All those who work in the energy policy, developing lines of action, or just managing this energy policy or designing it, were just invited to these different workshops in order to elaborate the national policy on climate change. And it is critical for a country because we need to have clear policies in order to move forward. And this is a very good lesson that we learned in Uruguay. And this is a framework of what I'll be talking about. Can we move on to the next slide? So you see the organizing structure of Uruguay. So yes, yes, we can see the slide. Slide. Yes, uh, perfect. So here, in this uh, slide, what we can see is uh, the organizational structure that we have in our country, because it's very important to understand it, because the energy uh, policy helped uh, to generate uh, the necessary structures in order uh, to move forward with this uh, policy. So if we don't define a, a structure, if we don't say that we have to reinforce uh, the National Directorate of Energy technically and administratively. So uh, uh, that's why I'm talking about this. I said I work in the National Directorate directorate uh, that depends uh, on the ministry of uh, it's uh, well actually we have one of uh, the three ministries uh, that uh, deal with energy so we have 14 different ministries uh, so and uh, now uh, here uh, we uh, 
all the decisions are validated by a, a council. This uh, gives a coherence uh, to a policy in a country. So there is a place uh, where uh, we uh, have uh, a definition. So what does uh, this uh, uh, policy define in Uruguay? So it defines uh, a direction or it defines uh, a specialized sector. And uh, in 2010, 2011, uh, we just defined a structure. And this uh, structure says uh, that uh, the we need to have uh, five uh, different technical uh, departments. So there is a part uh, for direction and uh, assessment. Uh, we have uh, five, we have renewables, uh, we have uh, energy efficiency, hydrocarbons, uh, uh, hydroelectric and uh, planning. Uh, so these are the five uh, different uh, areas. Uh, so the renewable area basically has an objective to generate uh, policies linked uh, to renewables uh, in order to really uh, reach uh, these uh, general uh, goals. So basically we have the legal framework in order to carry out this uh, policy and it is in contact with the academia, the public sector, the private sector, uh, civil society as well. Why? In order to be able to complement uh, uh, this uh, policy and to move uh, forward. So for each one of these uh, different uh, five uh, sections uh, we have the same thing. So this is uh, the planning uh, part. Uh, so this is what what we do uh, so uh, so for example uh, for uh, planning uh, so uh, we have uh, the planning and uh, statistics uh, uh, department uh, so we are responsible to update uh, the official uh, statistics uh, on energy so uh, we report uh, to the government about all the uh, statistics uh, that we have on energy so uh, uh, so uh, we work only on this information that has uh, to do with uh, energy so and then uh, we have an inter inter institutional uh, commission uh, basically and we're just uh, working on uh, uh, gas uh, emissions, and this is a part uh, of our work with the Ministry of uh, Environment, uh, which uh, is uh, working on the elaboration of the plans uh, related to uh, gas emissions. And I'm going to start uh, talking about uh, what we do in uh, our area of work uh, in uh, planning. So uh, in uh, planning, in order to be able to elaborate uh, what we call uh, the planning studies we have a, a planning manual so uh, this uh, manual for planning was developed uh, through a cooperation with uh, the international atomic energy agency and uh, uruguay had a very abrupt change in since uh, 2010, between 2010 and 2015. So the different hypotheses uh, that we had uh, to develop uh, were just changing a lot. Uh, so we had uh, a, a planning group that was a very good one. Uh, we had a structure that was still uh, growing and we, uh, but there was no uh, culture related to energy planning. So in order to incorporate this uh, culture within the structure of the Ministry of Energy, we uh, edited a manual. I'm telling you a story. So in 2009, uh, so we went, uh, we, uh, we just uh, tripled our uh, wind and we arrived to 500 uh, uh, megabytes and uh, in 2015 we had almost 1000 uh, megawatts uh, so you see uh, so uh, the uh, each time we just uh, finished the study when the study was uh, presented it was already outdated so all this uh, led us uh, also to really a work on the development of uh, planning. So that's why we have this uh, manual. This uh, manual helped us uh, to understand how we work uh, and uh, internally. So I'm just talking about all the different uh, departments of the Ministry of Energy. Uh, so what the manual uh, says, uh, so basically here, I am uh, going uh, to uh, get information about uh, the policies that were uh, developed, uh, the legal uh, frameworks, uh, <coughs> some 
innovative uh, technologies, uh, for example, uh, that we can incorporate uh, to the planning, all these uh, projects, uh, uh, the uh, time of investment for the projects, uh, the costs of the project, all this information is absolutely necessary uh, for the planner. And also, uh, we need uh, to uh, understand what type of information we need. Uh, so basically, uh, why don't we uh, carry out consultations with the public sector, with the private sector, etc.? Uh, so I know that renewables, uh, they uh, have uh, carried out uh, these consultations in the private public sector, in the academia, etc. So basically, we just gather all this information and we are just based on it uh, in our uh, planning. And secondly, the second uh, stage uh, in elaborating scenarios is uh, to enrich uh, this information with the necessary information uh, for the planner. So, for example, uh, the Ministry of Economy uh, uh, has uh, to know about uh, all the economic uh, foresights in the country, etc. Uh, so, here uh, we uh, gather all this information that is complementary uh, that will allow to develop the different uh, scenarios. And then we uh, have uh, the workshops. And the workshops are extremely important because in these uh, workshops, all the planners uh, present uh, the scenario and uh, the different uh, trends. Uh, so the uh, uh, trend uh, scenario is uh, basic and we build it based on the different hypotheses on which uh, we're working and we just generate a whole series of uh, uh, hypotheses uh, per uh, sector depending on uh, what uh, we were required uh, to do and this is very important why because uruguay is a country that is very small. Uh, so what is the impact of this? It's a huge impact uh, because uh, in other countries, we don't have uh, problems that we have in Uruguay. If I go to an elect... So basically, uh, the infrastructure that we need uh, to have, uh, for example, just only for three, uh, four or five uh, uh, cars uh, are absolutely fundamental when we just define uh, the sectorial uh, policies. We need uh, to carry out analysis in order to understand where we are going. Uh, so we only can just uh, use one technology because we are small, we are too small. We cannot just adopt different uh, technologies. Uh, so what do we do in the workshops? Uh, so per a sector, uh, for example, we just uh, study all the uh, policies uh, that are developed uh, in everything that has uh, to do with uh, uh, this uh, sector, uh, for example. So in, uh, so here we will have representatives uh, of uh, all the uh, representatives of the National Energy Directorate. Uh, for example, when we analyze uh, the penetration of natural gas uh, in order for it to be viable in Uruguay, the natural gas, somebody is just asking, uh, uh, for the floor and somebody needs to ask a question. Can you hear me? Yes, 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 we can hear you. Yeah, because I saw that Ruben was just raising his hand. Yeah. No, we're going to uh, answer uh, later on. Uh, yes, uh, brilliant. So what I was saying, it is uh, important. I'm giving you an example. When we analyze the uh, penetration of natural gas, uh, we said in order for it to be viable in the uh, residential sector, so we needed to have uh, three uh, things, uh, heating, uh, water, and uh, and cooking. So basically, uh, so we were just uh, studying the uh, different uh, uh, tools and renewables. Uh, no, for example, for the water, it has to be, it has to be solar. So basically, uh, what this uh, workshop does is just to define different scenarios. Uh, uh, but uh, maybe we can have alternative uh, scenarios where I have uh, to define uh, the different hypotheses uh, that. I in need. So that's why uh, these uh, workshops are fundamental with all the information uh, that uh, allows us uh, to uh, plan. So we have uh, the trends uh, that were validated uh, and uh, so this is uh, our uh, main uh, client uh, basically in order to shape uh, the way uh, they work. Uh, so if we determine, uh, for example, uh, that we're going uh, to 
uh, avoid using a certain quantity of energy due to a certain measure. So we have an economical uh, a price of each energy unit that we are going to save. So basically we have the different uh, scenarios and then we have alternatives. Uh, so we have, for example, the scenario for natural gas, uh, for the vehicles, etc. So in the next slide, uh, you're going to see how we use uh, these uh, different scenarios. So why do we use them? As I said, so one is uh, for uh, the uh, energy efficiency plan and then all the scenarios that no matter how many scenarios that we have uh, so all this is information in order uh, to determine the impact of the expansion so depending on the electricity need uh, uh, so i'm going to analyze what is uh, the different uh, what is the scenario the best scenario uh, for example if uh, well, these are different uh, scenarios uh, that uh, uh, we can analyze and we can analyze uh, the pros and cons of each uh, different uh, scenario. So the mobility scenario. So now we're working with Irina, for example, on this. Uh, uh, so basically we combine all the different uh, scenarios and sometimes uh, we just uh, work with other organizations. Uh, so in the case of Irina, we are just working on different uh, scenarios uh, of uh, penetration of electric buses, uh, for example, and uh, one of the results uh, there was that uh, if we are going to have uh, an electrical uh, bike, so basically we have 98% uh, of uh, uh, green uh, electricity, so uh, uh, you don't know uh, when they're going to get uh, connected. So your uh, electricity uh, production matrix uh, maybe will have a a component of a thermal uh, production that will be very high. So uh, there is a measure uh, to have a higher uh, penetration of electrical vehicles, but because of the times that, that these vehicles are used, so this is going to have uh, a negative impact. Uh, so we need uh, to analyze this. We need to analyze what are the precautions that, that we need to take, what the changes uh, we need uh, to adopt uh, in order uh, to really be as efficient as possible. So that's why these uh, scenarios are very important. Another uh, scenario was uh, the uh, emissions reduction uh, commitment set that we have. Uh, so when we presented these scenarios uh, to the uh, experts, uh, they said, uh, so uh, the only commitments uh, that we need uh, to produce are the ones that we are sure that uh, we can achieve uh, because we need uh, cultural changes, etc. So maybe these measures will not be able uh, just uh, to implement them. Uh, so we are uh, committing uh, for something that we will not be able uh, to uh, achieve. Uh, so that's why uh, we uh, just uh, uh, studied uh, all uh, these different issues uh, that had a developed uh, legal framework uh, uh, that were quite uh, developed in order to be as uh, realistic as uh, possible. So uh, we defined uh, uh, the different scenarios. Uh, so basically, in order to take decisions, uh, uh, we had uh, to see all the different scenarios uh, possible. So basically, we need to generate information for the uh, decision makers. Uh, and of course, uh, the political decision makers needed to have all this information before. So basically, if I receive uh, funding in order uh, to develop something, I can be more audacious uh, in the measures uh, and in my uh, commitments. Uh, so basically, if I want a reduction of 24%, uh, uh, so basically, this is the idea behind uh, the different uh, scenarios. Uh, can we move? Uh, to the next uh, slide, I have very little time left. Uh, so uh, the transparency of uh, this system is very important. I give you an example, which is uh, the monitor. What is the monitoring? Is Rafael uh, connected? Because he is working on this uh, monitoring. So we have the different uh, 
lines of action, the different measures uh, that uh, we have uh, constructed uh, to reach uh, the uh, commitments uh, and the goals. Uh, so we have a time frame, uh, for example, for the electrical uh, routes. Uh, so we needed to have uh, such and such uh, uh, kilometers uh, a year. Uh, so basically, through this monitoring uh, tool, we see that this uh, measure, well, we have a, a commitment. Uh, where are we uh, today in terms of the timeline? Uh, so this is uh, a, a transparency tool. Uh, so we uh, see how we are working, where we are now, and where we're going uh, to arrive. So basically, this is what I had uh, to uh, tell you, how uh, we work in Uruguay, all these uh, different uh, scenarios, how we get uh, organized uh, in order to work uh, together. And I'll be very happy to answer to any question, should you have any. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Alejandra. Your presentation was uh, uh, fantastic. Uh, and uh, this is exactly what uh, we are just uh, looking uh, for. And we want to explore in the region uh, to work on the institutional side, the political side, the organizational structure of the different organizations, the different scenarios, how these scenarios are just uh, used uh, for decision uh, making. Uh, for example, the example of electric uh, vehicles that you uh, gave is uh, very important. I'm going to ask uh, Alejandra, uh, just wait uh, for a second. Uh, after we have the presentations, uh, uh, presentation uh, from Ecuador, and then we'll have uh, a question and answer questions, if you don't mind uh, waiting. And now uh, we just uh, give uh, the floor to Ramiro uh, Diaz. Uh, welcome, uh, Ramiro. Can you hear us? Ramiro? Yes, yes, loud and clear, Ramiro uh, Diaz. Uh, thank you very much uh, for being with us. Uh, Ramiro is the uh, Director of Electricity Foresight at the Minister of Energy and Non-Renewable Natural Resources in Ecuador. He has uh, more uh, than 12 years of experience in the energy sector in Ecuador. He was the Director of uh, management uh, control. He was a counselor uh, for the industry sector in the Ministry of Renewable Energies. He was a director of energy uh, planning. He is in charge of the planning of uh, uh, electricity and the expansion of the Equatorian electrical uh, sector through uh, planning and the master plan for electricity in Ecuador. And now, and this is uh, very important for this uh, seminar, he is working on the development uh, of the national energy plan in Ecuador. So, uh, Ramiro, welcome. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for being with us. Can you hear me? Can you hear me all? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Pablo, for this opportunity. It's important to be able to share with you what we're doing in our country, our experiences. Alexandra, it's a great pleasure always to share with you and this forum. Um, we have met in other events related to energy, and it is always a pleasure for me to share with you. Well, let's move on to the point of my presentation. This is going to be brief on general aspects, a high level presentation on how we're working in our country in planning for the energy transition. This is the first slide. Um, please move on to the second one. Well, as a country, as many other countries in the region, we are aligned with the international agreements through the national government. We ratify our adherence to international agreements. We have now the public agenda 2023. It's a commitment that we have to honor and uh, we have been working in that uh, direction. In our constitution, we provide a framework for reference for the development of uh, plans for the energy transition. We have uh, used our instruments. Um, we have uh, instruments to leverage our office efforts, such as the organic law of the public service of electricity, which provided that it is compulsory to adhere to the planning instruments on energy that are important for us, such as the National Master Plan for uh, Electricity and also the 
National Plan for Energy Efficiency. With this plan, we ratify our commitment to encourage initiatives to face the climate change. As to energy efficiency, we have ratified the need for energy planning in combination with other sectors, with the participation of a number of stakeholders, transportation, farming, finance, environment, economics, uh, decentralized uh, governments, the academia, etc. This law, by the way, provides the organization of the National Committee on Energy Efficiency, which met for the first time last week. The purpose is to get aligned with all the initiatives and the policies that are being developed on energy mainly, with all the stakeholders from the energy industry. We also have the law of hydrocarbons, which leverages the development of policies in this industry. This is key for the country, for our economy. And this all takes us to the National Development Plan 1721. The next one, please. Well, the National Development Plan 1721 combines uh, directly uh, and incorporates the SDGs and the energy agenda. It is a public policy and it provides the development of the energy sector to face the energy transition. It includes the goals that we see in our country are important for our development, for the development of the energy sector, but of the country as a whole you know, then to adapt to climate change. So on this basis, we have developed some instruments for planning in the past years. One is the energy national agenda. As I said, also the national plan for energy efficiency, also the master plan for uh, electricity, which was developed um, a long ago, and it has been implemented already now it's an organizational culture in the sector. As a country, as I said, we have to fulfill the obligations we have assumed under the master electrical plan. And also another instrument is the national energy balance, which is reviewed on an annual basis. I have to um, highlight the support of the Energy Research Institute, which is a key uh, actor in this regard and has provided us a lot of input. Well, these planning instruments that I have shown you are key and have uh, helped us to develop the roadmap to be able to work in energy planning. As to energy planning, the National Energy Agenda um, provides a roadmap, as I said, for the future development of the uh, Ecuador's energy sector. It's an essential factor. And we have developed some initiatives to consolidate our sector. We have strategic objectives, uh, five main strategic objectives. One, a fully planned, equitable, and inclusive energy sector. Here, I have to point out an important aspect, the restructuring of the energy sector. In the past, we had the Ministry of Electricity, one Ministry of Hydrocarbons, and another one of Energy. But now, they have been integrated into a single ministry, which is the Ministry of Energy and No Renewable Resources. Many opportunities stem from this fusion. It is key to be able to develop intersectoral uh, energy planning. And this is why we are fostering the development of the national energy plan, the first one that we're going to have in the country, a national and overarching plan. Objective numbers two, a diversified renewable and sustainable energy matrix. As a country, and we'll see this later on again, well, years ago, we, didn't have the thermal component in, in our matrix, uh, but um, we had to 
consider the cost that's, that this uh, represented. It was a very complex issue. We have analyzed the importance of planning under the master plan, and we have fostered the development of several generation projects, but also taking into account the use of renewable resources that, that we have. Hydropower, for instance, accounts for more than 90% of the electrical matrix in our country to meet the national demand. And it has allowed us to exchange exports. We have been able to, to export uh, clean energy to our neighbor countries. Then we have objective number three, sovereignty and energy security. We want to guarantee the supply of uh, safe energy to the entire population. It's a topic which is always on the table. We have to do strong efforts and uh, combined work with other stakeholders. We have been working on this. We have to, as I said, provide, meet the internal demand, provide quality supply to all the users uh, in the electricity system. We have um, a coverage of around 97% of the population. There's still a gap that we have to fill in. That's a hard point, but we are uh, aligned to leverage our resources and use them to fill in that gap. Of course, we have to ensure also reliability uh, and, and supply of fuels. Still in our matrix, we have um, all those fuels that um, account for a large percentage, but we are developing new ways with this new roadmap. They are going to be substituted by clean energy, by electrical energy. That's one of the main objectives that we have. And of course, now objective number four, efficient use of energy. We have already developed the regulatory framework through the law, through the organic law of energy efficiency to be able to leverage the development of the plans and programs aimed at energy efficiency. We have then the National Plan for Energy Efficiency as a, an outcome of this effort. There were other initiatives in the past aiming at a more efficient use of energy, um, creating awareness among the population, developing a culture of energy efficiency. This is a lot of work that we have done. And at the end of the presentation, I will give you a review of uh, some projects. And objective number five, regional energy integration and Ecuador's contribution to sustainable global energy development. As a country, we have uh, developed some interconnections. Uh, a strong one is with Colombia, another one with Peru. Good interconnection. We believe that energy uh, exchange is a great opportunity for all countries. We should be able to work hand in hand with our neighbor countries. This will uh, result into opportunities and benefits for everybody. Hydro hydropower is an example of this. So we have to get aligned to share global and regional initiatives and also results. Now on this slide, I'd like to focus on the National Energy Plan 2050. These are our objectives. Um, it's, um, it has a main objective, which is to define a comprehensive and sustainable strategy for the development of the energy system by 2050. These are the central elements, uh, economics, social, environment, governance. Uh, also, of course, we have to include hydrocarbons, transportation. We have to start developing initiatives to uh, leverage all these efforts. We have the electromobility issue, which is nothing new, but we have to fulfill some characteristics in order to ensure that this will be a sustainable transformation in the long term. We have to see how the supply of uh, electrical energy will be. Well, the energy plan is uh, seen as a plan based on four central elements. As I said, the economic one, to guarantee timely supply, and to guarantee that we meet the uh, the supply of uh, the demand of energy on a timely basis. Of course, we have to develop infrastructure. It's not only national demand. Well, that's key, of course. 
but of also we have to bear in mind the exchange of energy with our neighboring countries, as I said before. And we have to use uh, renewable energy sources for this to provide the best economic conditions for the country. As a country, as a region, it's a must that we do this if we want to develop the energy sector. Then the social element, we cannot neglect and forget, which is the ultimate objective, which is to increase uh, access to energy for all the population on their quality conditions that are sound and appropriate. This will develop in turn, will generate in turn development, economic development, social development, individual development. Then the um, environmental element. The environment is key. We have uh, international commitments that we have uh, engaged in and that we have to comply with. We have mitigation of environmental impact, for instance, local impact, the, the, min, the decrease of uh, gas emissions, and also, of course, to increase energy efficiency. And last but not least, another central element, which is governance. Energy, and this is under our constitution, we have to guarantee supply of energy, but it has to be sustainable through time. And the state has to be the entity to ensure um, supply in the long term through a sound governance uh, structure. So there will be no interruption in the fulfillment of the energy and demand meeting uh, objectives of the government. On the next slide, we see how we're doing this. Also, Alejandra referred to the to a structure that they have. Well, as the energy planning uh, agents, we have to base our work on information and statistics, which are key. That is why it is so important to develop the energy balance and to have also energy statistics. Well, in this effort, we need prospecting studies, we need scenarios to visualize which will be the best alternatives for the future and that will be cost beneficial for the country. Of course, we want renewable energies, but obviously that is associated to a cost, an opportunity cost. So that is the analysis that we have to do through time. As to the National Energy Plan, of course, we are analyzing a number of scenarios. One is energy substitution, which is the foundation for the future of the country. And then from there, we would like to look for alternative scenarios. We will have low scenarios, uh, um, middle scenarios, high scenarios, depending on where they will be located in the uh, energy matrix. And of course, because all this has a cost and we have to assess that cost so that the opportunity of implementing this in the long run will be uh, analyzed. And uh, this is also associated to infrastructure, to the improvement of fuels, etc. And in the high scenario, there's got to be a strong change in the energy matrix, uh, replacement of uh, equipment, uh, more aggressive replacement of non-efficient equipment, improvement of fuels, Again, energy efficiency. Um, here you have electromobility. In our country, we're analyzing this point. We see that we are providing the conditions for this to be sustainable in the long term. A key element is to have a renewable energy matrix. Otherwise, all these other processes will not survive through time. For instance, electromobility. So this has to go hand in hand with a number of changes. We have to transform that scenario first. Thanks to the organic law of energy efficiency, we have now important provisions that will support. Started in 2025 in Ecuador, public transportation will have to be renewed. The new buses 
the joining the uh, vehicle part will have to have electrical motors. So this is, an, I know, a very ambitious milestone, but we are seeking to achieve that. And we are now starting to provide the conditions for that to become a reality. On the next slide, we have the process to develop the national energy plan up to the year 2050. Here you have the milestones, and I have to highlight the support of the um, Inter-American Development Bank, which has helped us and is supporting us in this plan. Up to December 2020, a year which was uh, uh, different and atypical for many of us, and that, that led to many problems because of the pandemics, well, up to December 2020, we managed to design the planning uh, scheme uh, for this year. By July this year, we should have uh, in place the terms of reference and the bids uh, and the information for bidders to conduct the market survey. And by November, we should be engaged in the consultant work. Here are the milestones for the 21-23 period. Of course, a diagnosis of the energy sector with the fusion of all the of the merge of the ministries that I mentioned before, we have created synergies among the stakeholders of the sector. But of course, we need a diagnosis to establish the baseline. Where are we? Where do we have to do more development? Is it in hydrocarbons, hydropower, or whatever? That's just an example. We need a diagnosis of the energy sector. Then we will develop energy, economic, environmental, and social scenarios. That is key. On the basis of these scenarios, we will do analysis, further analysis. Each scenario has a cost for the country, and those costs have to be considered in order to determine the availability of resources. Also, national energy strategies and policies will be developed. This will provide a, a foundation for the development of initiatives in the energy sector. All these will have to be supported by a national energy uh, perspective uh, analysis for 2050. And by December 2023, we should have already in place the national energy plan. This will be an intersectoral planning instrument that will allow to develop some central elements and some sub elements. One element is the national plan for energy efficiency. That's one part of the whole and also the other element, as I said, the national energy agenda, which has uh, allowed us to develop a roadmap for working in our country. So this is how we are um, seeing the energy planning effort in our country and it is key to reach its completion by 2050. And as I said before, next one, one of the main central elements, one of the pillars of the country has been a significant change in the matrix. Here you have it, a change in the electrical matrix. As I said, we had a hydroelectrical or hydropower that was uh, 50%, but now in 2020, we're closing the year with 90% almost for hydropower in blue. This will foster even more the development of renewable energies. And there is a thermal component, as you can see on the pie chart, because of us safety reasons and supply reasons, we have to keep that and we're working on optimizing it. And then we have the energy exchanges that uh, provide a cost of opportunity with our neighbor countries. And last but not least, some initiatives that I referred to earlier that I'd like to share with you on energy efficiency to drive the change of inefficient equipment. We have heard this in past presentations. Uh, there is a lot to do in this regard. And 
we also as a country have a tried and are trying to change the use of inefficient equipment. We started first with the uh, electricity saving uh, light bulbs. Well, now are moving to other types of equipment and devices to save energy in the residential sector, for instance. Also, another initiative is energy management and optimization of industrial systems. We have been working and implementing new plans in this uh, sector. Another one, efficient public lighting. We have been working in plans for the development of LED technology for uh, efficient consumption and use. This has provided alternative uh, um, options to the population. Another very important aspect, efficient cooking, of course, and also the oil sector. We are working on an interconnection of the oil sector to the national interconnected system to be able to capitalize on the energy that we have to be able to provide supply for operations. Then we have Cala Galapagos as a country. We feel very proud of our islands in Galapagos. Um, it's, a, it's a matter of proud. And we have developed many initiatives for energy management in Galapagos for efficient use of energy. And also we want to implement the initiative of zero fossil fuels in this area because it's a piece of jewelry. It belongs to all mankind. And last but not least, energy efficiency rules and regulations. This has been fostered uh, since many years ago. So as you see, we have a number of initiatives for energy efficiency. These are the main ones, the list is longer, but I just wanted to highlight these ones. Well, this is what I had for today as to how we have been working on the energy sector. As you see, there have been important changes at the level of institutions, but also new opportunities have emerged and new instruments for, um, of regulatory nature have uh, been developed, all with the same purpose and intent to look for a common um, effort in the development and implementation of the National Energy Plan of Ecuador. This is all, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, excellent. You gave us a great scan of a very uh, complex uh, topic, which is uh, energy planning at the ministry, starting by the policy, you went through these scenarios and also the plans for energy efficiency. Well, now let's have a discussion with the moderator, myself, Alejandra and Ramiro. Would you please um, turn on your cameras so that we can see you? Thank you very much. And may I remind participants that you can uh, send your questions in writing. We are going to select some questions for our panel members today. So pay attention. Well, I'd like to start by a question for both uh, speakers. Alexander, Alejandra mentioned that the energy planning process uh, sometimes expires um, too soon. What I mean is that as soon as you finish a plan, it expires because things have changed. In Brazil also, that is the case. They say there that planning is an open process. It never ends. It is never close, it is a continuous process, and that that needs to be understood. Because if you become frustrated because the plan was not uh, ended, then you feel effortless. Well, at IRENA, we have the experience that are um, agencies that share their plans with other bodies, but there are agencies in, in Ecuador or ministries that please the first they will engage the work of uh, external consultants and then they will build on their experience uh, in the long term now how do you see this let's say internalization 
of the uh, scenario building capabilities. Is there any space in your ministries or agencies for that? So that this would be a process by the ministry or are there other processes that will be still provided by external consultants or agencies, for instance, perhaps advanced modeling for those uh, types of, uh, of work. So that's my question. I would like to put this on the table. Alejandra, you can answer first. And please, short, intro, uh, short comments so we can take more questions. Thank you. Yes, uh, the best thing is complement things, not to move from one place to another. As we say in Uruguay, planning is a new thing. From the state, you need to have first a robust national policy. Otherwise, you will not be able to assess whether what the consultant is giving you is something copied from another country or is something that fits your country. Who knows the features of your country? The government planners, the national planners. So I guess efficiency is achieved with complementation. You complement your efforts. Of course, I cannot have an all-encompassing planning sector, including all the methodologies and models models that there are. I cannot have that in my single country. So I need to complement my efforts, my planning efforts with others. You have to be open-minded. In my personal opinion, you have to have still a robust area capable of assessing whether you are being told or given fits your purpose and your need. An example, in Uruguay, one of the measures was to eradicate the use of wood for cooking. But that's a cultural issue, using wood for cooking. In, a, in Uruguay, there are some dishes that you only prepare with wood. Uh, so that is not going to be changed. Uh, you, have, you cannot exclude firewood. It's a cultural thing. And when you bring in a consultant, they would say, no, uh, that's not logical. So you have to combine those things. You, need, you see, that's why I think I need, we need to complement. We have to have a mix of opinions. That's the optimum thing. Thank you, Alejandra. Excellent answer. Ramiro? Yes. Yes, using consultant um, has been also a, an option in my country. Sometimes there are processes that we are not aware of, and we need to leverage our work with the experience and expertise of uh, international consultants or external consultants. But the point is that in the long term, you have to build capabilities in your country so that will be sustainable in the future. I said it in my presentation, if we develop a national energy plan, but then if you want to change a scenario or analyze a different scenario, we have to go back to point zero, doing the whole contracting process again. That makes no sense. So the point is first focus on the topics on which we are strong and we can leverage our effort with consultant efforts. Uh, but the whatever consultant comes to our country, they have also to help us build our capabilities so we will be sustainable in the long term. There are some planning areas that are not as relevant. And for those, we would need, of course, um, extra support. But take the electrical sector in Ecuador. We have our electricity master plan. It is well known at all levels of the electricity sector. It's compulsory. You have to fulfill, you have to adhere to it. It's mandatory. We have to get to that. So we'll be mature as to the development of new energy sources. And there is an important initiative that I have mentioned many times, the National Energy Plan. With adherence to this plan, the success will be guaranteed, I guess. In the long term, it has to be sustainable, and it should be able to manage with the capabilities inside the Ministry of Energy, our ministry. Thank you, Ramiro, for your comment. 
Ramiro, you mentioned that electricity plants in Ecuador uh, are solid. Now, doing or developing a national energy plan is a big challenge because it encompasses the whole energy sector. Perhaps it cannot be as regulatory as the electrical uh, sector. Now you are talking about the whole uh, sector. It's an overarching plan, that national energy plan. So my question is focusing on scenarios, and this is a question for both of you. How do you think, and I think Alejandra mentioned this initially, how do you think the participation of the different stakeholders for the development of the key scenario. How did you manage to develop your energy plans? Ramiro, I think you had a timeline for the plan development of scenarios. What is going to be the participation of the, not only of the private sector, but the academia, NGOs, the government? How do you see the development on a, in a participative manner of the, all the other stakeholders in the development of those scenarios? How do you see participation, in other words? Well, the participation process takes place as follows. Our areas are related to the academia, private sector, etc. So we take their knowledge the sectoral the sectoral knowledge we don't we cannot hold huge workshops we don't have that capacity and that is not efficient so and i'm talking specifically about energy but that applies to other areas and then those areas will work with us it's like um, downsizing on doing this everything at a specific level. I don't know if this is clear or if it was clear in my presentation. We develop, we define the plan planners based on the information we have, based on the progress of some actions that have been implemented already, based on the characteristics of the information we have. On that basis, the planner defines the base. It happened to us that uh, somebody wanted a uh, given base year, another one wanted another one, but no, there's got to be a single base year. So there are things that we define in planning. Then after defining, we validate through workshops. Uh, for instance, perhaps uh, energy efficiency will say, no, this action is not, uh, um, it's not possible. There is something missing still, so you cannot uh, go after that action yet. So we validate with all the parties involved. That's part of the question, right? And the other part is how we incorporate all the parties involved. For instance, how do we incorporate the private sector, the academy, etc.? Well, if it, energy efficiency is doing something, we have to talk to they have to talk to the academia, to the private sector, to the Ministry of Economy, et cetera, et cetera, to see if the actions are uh, feasible. Instead of meeting with the private sector, uh, uh, all the time we also meet with other sectors and, and uh, parties. That is methodology that we follow in our work. It is a dynamic process. That's why we have to do modeling, and we have a manual that tells you the step to follow to reach to a given scenario. That's the way of work that we have found that it best fits our purposes. Before I give the floor to Ramiro, a question that we have, how, how to combine the number of scenarios so that we be understood by the stakeholders. The time horizon is defined also in our trend analysis or trend scenario. So the study goes after up to 2030 or 2050. Initially, it went up to 2024, but it was expanded. The actions that are, are taken further to 2050. But this is part of what I said is the trend scenario. 
you have to define a time horizon. Otherwise, you will have a great deal of extra work that it would be impossible. Also, we're trying to work on the basis of measures and not scenarios. If renewables tell me up to this date, this should have a given impact. Well, that measure goes with some characteristics. Then with all those actions, I build my scenarios. I don't know if this is clear. For instance, if I say that 100% of the energy matrix will be finished by 2025, but another scenario says that 2030, the measure is the same. According to this scenario, I will consider a given policy. There is, there is an, an scenario that to us um, is very important, which is efficiency, because our customers need efficiency to do their work. And this scenario defines other scenarios. And then we have like the, like the sub-scenarios that stem from this big scenario and key scenario. If you want to undertake more aggressive actions, then you have to do otherwise. You will have to consider the sub-scenarios. But as to the number, we, we always have two, three, or four. We have never have, uh, had to say, no, there are too many scenarios. Let's exclude some. Uh, for instance, we're focusing on transportation with IRENA. And this includes a lot of other scenarios. And this is being done with an external consultant because this exceeds our capabilities. This is being worked on with a consultant. And after all of those scenarios, once they have a number of scenarios, I will choose some scenarios to incorporate them or to mainstream them into the energy plan. So there is this, um, entity that uh, selects these scenarios. But we don't run those uh, analysis. This is the most efficient way we have found to, to select from our scenarios. But it never happened to us that we had too many that we didn't know which one to choose. The number is not that big. Thank you. Ramiro, as to the National Energy Plan in Ecuador. This has entailed a lot of work. Now, how do you see the participation of the civil society in the, cons in the building of scenarios to carry out that plan? Our friends from Ecuador are asking how they can participate. So how do you envision the participation? And could you please comment on what Alejandra said? Because you mentioned three scenarios uh, three main scenarios, how were they defined? Can this change, this chain of scenarios or this string of scenarios? How do you handle this aspect of not getting lost among thousands of scenarios? Thank you, Pablo. From our experience and from the, our experience with the, our master plan, let me tell you how we did it. To develop the scenarios for the master plan, we did it as uh, in Uruguay. The trend scenarios, we developed them. We analyze the scenarios using the base information that we have uh, in our country. So we develop the trend scenarios. From them, we add efficiency energy projects, um, low development projects, things like that. And then we define a base case for that. Of course, the interaction is coordinated also with other productive sectors in the countries. They have their own initiatives and policies um, to contribute to the development of the sector. So we have to consider them as well. And when we meet with them, we analyze the degrees of certainty of their analysis and ours. Sometimes it is slow. We have to cooperate all that in the base scenarios, the one that we handle, that is a step forward, the initial scenarios. 
And then there is a third scenario, the productive matter case, for instance. There we analyze what can we do. We have to develop the cases that will be feasible and their specific characteristics. We have to be open-minded also to many options, but we do analysis with a different degree of certainty, perhaps lower than with the base scenarios. This interaction is key. And with the experience that we have already with the electricity plan, well, we have gained uh, time. And the, at the end of the day, the national plan is submitted to the consideration of the population. This is how we have been doing it historically. Now, as to the energy plan, interaction is key. We're going to leverage this through the organic law of uh, energy efficiency which calls for the participation of all these sectors, industry, productivity, uh, urban development, transportation, economy, finance, etc. Of course, as I said, we could dream a lot of many things, but if you don't have the resources, then the scenarios will not be feasible. And obviously, uh, if we also have the participation of those stakeholders plus the decentralized governments and the academia, we can gain a lot. This is how we have leveraged the development of our plans. We have, get, we have got involved, uh, we have got all those stakeholders involved, all the sectors in the country, to be able to move forward with their support because they provide support when they provide impact and information and analysis. An example, uh, Public Works Ministry and Transportation Ministry, they have developed a strategy for sustainable mobility. This will have to be leveraged by the other sectors, of course. They cannot work in isolation because they need the, the sources of energy to foster that development, those uh, vehicles. So there has to be a combined effort. Of course, Sometimes it is difficult to get directly to the population in general, but then we have the academia, other organizations in the sector energy, which have to participate. They have done so far and they will continue to because they are key for scenario building. And as to scenario building, as I said, we have as a, refer as a reference, the master plan, a BAU scenario. Uh, high, uh, medium, and low scenarios, as I described in my presentation. Having a number of scenarios will not contribute too much if we just generate uncertainties and uh, um, lack of knowledge with those. That's why we have to, let's say, downsize the number of scenarios and get to a few ones. And then the decision will be made on the basis of the resources available and on the capacity that we have to implement one or two or three scenarios. That's what we are doing. Thank you, Ramiro, for your answer. I have uh, two questions for Ecuador and Uruguay on transportation. Alejandra had mentioned transportation slightly. The question is how to break up with this thing, which came first, the chicken or the egg? In scenario building and in electric mobility, do I increase the number of electric uh, vehicles first or do, or do I build electricity stations first and then increase the number of vehicles. So what do we do? How to break up with this bad cycle? Because then if you don't, at the end of the day, nothing is done. So this is a question on transportation. The demand in transportation is around 50% in the matrix of Ecuador. What would be the way for Ecuador to break up with that trend that transportation is a huge energy consumer. What possibilities would you consider according to your plan? Hydrogen, electricity, what hydro? How could you do that? You have already made a first step, but how does transportation fit in that national energy plan? Please provide your answers, Alejandra. Yes, thank you. Well, 
there, it is not much probable that the market will change. I cannot uh, introduce uh, electric vehicles unless there is an acceptance among the population. We're just at the test stage in my country. We're doing tests. It is not that the population will decide or not to change. These are sort of pilot tests. Um, we have sort of uh, elements that we have suggested. In this case, we have the municipal governments. They have the number plate of the taxi, but uh, some conditions have to be met in order for these cars to be turned into electrical cars, and they will have to have a charger also. So this starts developing credibility among the population in the sense that it is economically feasible and good. So it's a step, it takes steps, little steps. First, we have to know the characteristics of the element that we're introducing and also the population. We need only one technology because uh, as I said, my country is very small. Um, if I only are going to have three electrical vehicles in the country, that will not cost efficient. So that's why I said we need a common policy, a common technology in our country. So as I said, well, we're doing tests with um, what we call cap captive fleets of vehicles. Um, with a few vehicles, we try to turn them into electrical and see how it goes. And the companies will have to also see if they can cope with that technology, if they can pay for that technology. It is not just that I say, oh, I'm going to bring electrical cars to the country and chargers. No, that's not the case. That's not the way it works. That would be an inappropriate use of resources. We have to have the support of public companies and private companies as well. The public companies are in charge of uh, electrical generation. There is no monopoly, but they deal with the distribution of electricity. So this company, for instance, is developing the electrical routes because this sort of part of their planning policies. And we are also working on hydrogen because electricity will solve one part of the demand, but the, then hydrogen uh, is, is also an important source that cannot be put aside. So we have to start thinking about the structure, about how things are being changed and how and, uh, on how the paradigm is changed in the country. It's a continuous dialogue which is required. It's a continuous dialogue with all the stakeholders that will be impacted or that will be benefited with a given policy. So we have to reach consensus. Step by step, we provide regulatory framework. For instance, as to residential consumption, how am I going to change the consumption overnight? Um, I have to start by knowing how much the, the consumption is. Then I have to assess the policy. Then I have to validate it. So it is not only I'm going to do it this way and see what happens. No, no. We have to consider many aspects based on the regulatory framework. Then in electricity, we are having, for instance, a given company working, uh, a private one, a public one, etc. We are having the USEA, which is the regulatory uh, body for energy and water, etc. It's a complex matter. And we move on and make progress little by little, step by step. And the pilot tests have helped us a lot and uh, international support of, as well. Uh, example, the energy efficiency project was uh, a project that was started years ago, but then years went on and the project became part of the national plan. And there are a lot of people there who are very valuable and have a lot of experience. And, and they have experience now because initially we had international support. And then when the international support left, we were in good shape and we were able to continue the work. 
So in Uruguay, we learn things and then we give continuity to, to things because of what we have learned. It is not that then when the international support moves away, then we stop and we don't do anything. No, we continue our efforts because we learn. But in addition to this, there is a culture that you have to re-educate and change. Well, this is how we have developed things in, in our country and how this is how we have made progress. Thank you, Alejandra. Well, we are running short of time. Um, we have to do the polling. We have around 200 people. Um, can you answer? Thank you. As a country, justamente no es el, el tema de solventar eh, lo, lo que corresponde al tema de electrolineras. O sea, no podemos impulsar. We cannot foster development in our country unless we have uh, the support of other parties. And um, as in vehicles, if you don't have electricity stations, you cannot introduce electrical vehicles. And as I say, it's a circle which comes first. We need the intervention of other stakeholders, private sector, public sector, to develop alternatives, of course. And the electricity stations is seen as a starting point. We have to provide an example as a country, downstream in the long term is what I mean. In our country, there are two key aspects, two key points for debate. How am I going to charge my vehicle? And what am I going to do with the battery at the end of its useful life? So we're working all this with the entities. And this is to provide safety to the population as, as to public transportation, it is more complex. The Ministry of Transportation and Public Works is the ruling entity. The competition in transportation is by the decentralized governments. So you have to find a mechanism to tell them, look, change your bus. It is a diesel bus today by changing for an electricity bus, uh, which will be cheaper and you will be able to have the same capacity, number of passengers, etc. You see, you have to find the way to introduce this into the mind of people. Obviously, um, if you don't reach this balance or awareness, it is not possible to foster the initiatives. As, I, as it was said in Uruguay, we have also conducted pilot projects in Guayaquil, Quito, Cuenca, as well. So, as I said, you have to do an effort on the side of the government, of the state, provide the example, give the example so that they will hear you. Thank you, Ramiro. Antonio. Okay, uh, so Antonio, uh, we have a dynamic uh, poll uh, that uh, we want to do with uh, everybody in order uh, just uh, to see uh, the different uh, scenarios. Uh, you Here you have the questionnaire right here. So the first question is what areas that need strengthening to improve uh, the development and use of long-term energy scenarios for an energy uh, transition. We have uh, five uh, scenarios. So, this uh, is an institutional uh, answer, uh, participatory processes, scenarios, the visualization tools, partnerships with academia, coordination, etc. So, uh, if you can uh, answer the second question, uh, has uh, to do with the contact, uh, basically, what features of the energy transition should be included in long-term energy scenarios. So, uh, electric uh, vehicles, uh, consumer behavior, 
the demand side response, innovation, digitalization, and use electrification, green hydrogen. Uh, so, of course, uh, there are many other uh, themes, uh, but we just selected uh, the most uh, critical issues uh, that uh, we hear a lot when we talk about uh, energy transition. Okay, Antonio, uh, can we see the results or not yet? No, basically the people are still voting. So we have 85 answers so far and we still needed to wait. So um, just a very fast question to Ramiro. Alejandra uh, talked in uh, the NSVs. Uh, in her last uh, slides, and you just talked about uh, the uh, environment, uh, which is one of the four pillars uh, of your energy plan. Uh, so how far are we from the fact that we'll have an NDC scenario, a profound decarbonization that is aligned with the objectives of uh, Paris? Are we engaged in this uh, sense? Uh, are we far away uh, from it? Uh, there are many countries who are just uh, doing this, especially in Europe. Uh, and uh, here, uh, so basically, uh, this uh, link between climate and energy is not as solid in other countries. So how do you see uh, this uh, scenario that is uh, aligned uh, with uh, your energy scenarios? I, well, also, uh, very fast uh, because uh, we have no time. Uh, so basically what we are uh, working on, so, so basically we have uh, a, a concept of the response to the climate change that uh, we have an interinstitutional group uh, uh, that is formed by all these stakeholders uh, basically have an incidence on climate change. So basically we have all uh, who are just uh, working on energy planning. Uh, we uh, participate in this uh, group. Uh, so this uh, group uh, last year or at the beginning of this year, if I remember, we just uh, organized the first uh, virtual uh, workshop with uh, representatives from the academia, civil society, those who are just working in energy planning in order to build this 2050 decarbonization plan. I believe that Uruguay is really advanced in this because we have the cartography of the main emissions in order to reach the objectives. I don't want to extend because I will not leave any time to Ramiro for him to answer, but I believe that we are very well placed in 2022. We are going uh, to revise uh, our NDC uh, plan and we are committed to it. So, Ramiro, yes, uh, well, in our energy plant, uh, plan, uh, we are going uh, to analyze uh, our NDC objectives. Uh, we, as I said, we need to see in which uh, direction we have uh, to go, what are the different measures uh, that we have uh, to apply, uh, can we or not? Uh, we need uh, also, of course, uh, to uh, study the cost, uh, the resources, uh, the uh, development uh, also actions uh, that are linked also to the fight against climate change. Uh, so we need uh, to harmonize our energy plan uh, with the uh, different uh, energies uh, that the Ministry of the Environment uh, 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 is carrying out. Uh, so we need uh, to align uh, both uh, plans. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, basically we took into account all the environmental uh, aspects uh, when we developed our plans. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we see that those uh, long-term energy plans uh, are just advancing and this is uh, very exciting. Uh, so we see that the coordination among government institutions is the leader uh, theme in terms of uh, the development of long-term energy scenarios. Uh, also, uh, we have also the participatory uh, processes also in terms of the characteristics of the energy uh, transition, uh, the electric uh, uh, vehicles, uh, electric uh, mobility also. Uh, but uh, the challenge is how uh, to work with the uh, 
uh, different uh, transport models uh, in order to include them in the energy scenarios. And also the consumer behavior uh, was the second most uh, voted answer. These are the two main themes that, that are public uh, today. I believe are very important. We just reached uh, the end of our event today. Uh, uh, we are a little bit late, but thank you very much, Alejandra Ramiro, for these excellent uh, uh, presentations. We're extremely satisfied uh, with your presentations. We wish you all the best uh, in your institutions. We want to thank uh, also uh, the uh, public. Uh, next time, we'll have Salvador and Chile, who will be just talking about uh, planification, uh, the different elaboration of uh, scenarios. Uh, so in two weeks, uh, we are going uh, to meet. Uh, we want to thank you uh, very much, and we wish you a, a very good day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ramiro, Alejandra. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Um,